Actually, I do have a very interesting uh, life, but I wasn't going to I wasn't going to write about that. And I haven't written anything. Uh, I've made a I've made a couple of audio tapes of some very very interesting episodes that have occurred uh, back as far as 1960, 61, in that time frame. Now, were you in Vietnam early on in 60, 61 with the? I was, my first tour in Vietnam was 65. I think about June of 65. And where were you stationed at that time? At Benoit, just north of Saigon, in the 602nd, Sky Raider, A1. The whole time you've been flying Sky Raiders? Well, I, I flew Sky Raider 65, uh, June 65 to June 66. Uh, and I moved around a lot because our unit moved around. We I initially was at uh, Benoit, in the 602nd, and then we uh, and then we pulled alert uh, TDY at Quignon, which is a little a little PSP runway uh, just north of Matran. We uh, we'd send four airplanes at a time and and four or five six uh, pilots, and we pulled alert there. So we rotated in and out from Benoit to Quignon, back to Benoit, and. Uh, and then the unit moved to Nitran, and we stayed there for uh, probably, I guess, a month or so. Uh, and our next move was to Udorn in Thailand. Uh, that was in support of the street uh, search and rescue mission, the SAR mission, uh, which we began to participate in in 1965. With uh, TDY occasionally to Quignon, uh, uh, to NKP, rather, to, to Nakam Phanam in uh, Thailand. And that again was sort of an outpost. It was basically a deserted airport at that time with a PFP runway. And it was, we were roughing it. What is so a PFP they, runway? Pierce Steel Planking. Okay, kind of like they used uh, in the World War II temporary, campaign. Yeah, uh, temporary, temporary stuff. Uh, type thing. Uh, so we started pulling SAR alert. Uh, search and rescue alert from uh, from uh, Nakam Phanam, which is, you've heard it called NKP. Mm -hmm. When you hear them refer to NKP or Nakam Phanam or Naked Fanny, you hear the term Naked Fanny, that's NKP. Okay. Uh, anyway, that, that was uh, really my, my last uh, assignment. Then, uh, having been promised a, uh, a tour of choice after that first combat tour, I flew about 325 missions in, between June of 65 and June 66. And I thought I was going to sent, be sent to Europe, but uh, at the last minute they decided they needed instructor pilots at Herbert Field down near Fort Walton Beach, Florida. So I got diverted and sent to Hurlbut as a as a Sky Raider instructor. So I instructed uh, both American and Vietnamese pilots at uh, at Herbert Field, uh, right outside of Fort Walton Beach. How many pilots do you think that you've instructed and taught how to fly? Uh, you mean in the A1? Yeah. In the, in the sky? Yes. Well, lots. Maybe a dozen or more. Uh, I, I worked a lot with Vietnamese pilots learning to fly the Sky Raider, learning to fly the A1. And uh, they were basically pilots, but they weren't checked out in, in that airplane. So my job was teaching them that airplane. And, uh, how did you conquer the language barrier? Did you have an interpreter? Because I remember yesterday, was it you that was saying, you know, if it's my stick? You know, no, somebody else was saying, uh, wait, tell him that it's my stick, and if it's not, I'm going to hit him on the head. Right. Was right. that you that was saying that? No, I didn't say that, but uh, uh, they they uh, they spoke pretty good English by the time we got them. Okay. I mean, they went through a, a program where they learned English, and they spoke pretty good English. Good. And... Uh, but they, they, were, they were already pilots, aviators, when I got them. All I had to do was teach them a new airplane and, uh, because they hadn't stepped foot inside of a, uh, an A-1 until, uh, until we got it. 
I also instructed uh, senior officers, senior American uh, officers uh, who were en route to uh, uh, to Vietnam. So I and uh, then I had an opportunity. <laughs> I think I'm not going to tell the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you the condition I was in when I volunteered for my second tour, but uh, I met the guy who was putting the squadron together for uh, an, an A1H squadron, which is a single seat version of the Sky Raider sitting right out here on the ramp, the one that, uh, that Neil flies all the time, and we saw fly yesterday. But it was exciting to me to get into that airplane. and uh, I. Again, I don't know where this is going, but my uh, my personal life was in turmoil at that time. Uh, I had a little bit of a, a marital problem, and my wife and I were not getting along real well. And uh, so, when I was asked to vo if I wanted to volunteer to go to war again in the Sky Raider, I said, "Sign me up, Coach," <laughs> and uh, and so I did. And I. Uh, I was real uh, excited about flying the single seat version of this airplane. Same basic airplane, same same wing, same engine, same performance, uh, just a little more fighter pilot feel to it. Uh, you know, it looks a little more uh, like an exciting, sexy airplane. So I was ready to go, and I went. Um, yesterday you were talking about uh couple of missions that you were on and we had that documented where you were talking about hitting a couple of trees you oh, know through Willie Pete no 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 <laughs> what are some of your other favorite moments in the Sky Raider um, anything that comes to mind you know something that happened in a mission where you uh, went in to uh, help out you know some fuck guys or whatever I'll be honest uh, I, I flew I flew so many that were exciting. Uh, uh, they all kind of run together in my mind, and and there are not many that. Uh, yeah, there's a couple that, that that stand out. But if I told you about them, it'd sound like bragging because I got awarded. Uh, 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 I got I got a couple of silver stars for for some of the missions that I flew and and. Uh, and I don't talk about them much because one thing, it just sounds like you're bragging and I don't like that. So, I understand that. So I just don't talk about it very much. How about a funny moment with any of the other guys, whether it happened on the ground or in the air, anything? Okay, I can tell you a couple. There we go. <laughs> I can tell you a couple of funny moments. I used to carry a tape recorder, cassette tape recorder with me on my flights. And uh, uh, we had, a, we had a, a new guy who was kind of checking out as a lead you know, you got to fly wing before you can be lead. Mm -hmm. Well, I was flying wing, checking a pilot out as a new lead. And so I took my tape recorder and uh, I narrated a, a fake flight that was, uh, that, that, and I narrated things that were occurring on this flight that didn't really occur. And uh, and I made it sound like these things were really occurring until I got back and played the cassette recorder for the guy that, that we were playing a trick on. And I still got that tape, and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty humorous. So did you but, keep all of your cassette tapes? Uh, no. No, I wish I did. I wish I did. Uh, I don't have all the tapes, and in fact... Uh, I've, I've lost some of the records that I kept on, on some of the flights that I, uh, uh, that I flew. They got mixed up in the divorce and, and misplaced, and, mm -hmm. and so I don't have all the records I wish I had. But every, there, were, there were lots of light moments, and uh, there were some stark, raving, crazy moments. But uh, I'm just so lucky to... My wife thinks it's an absolute miracle. She, she uh, kind of makes fun of the fact that I'm not terribly, terribly religious. Uh, 
and I don't know why I'm still here. To tell you the truth, I, I just, I just, I've led a charmed life. I, I, some of the stories that I could tell mm -hmm. have nothing to do with sky readers. It, it's, it's other things. That's it, quite all right. Go ahead and let uh, one rip. Anything it, you'd like, sir. It, some of them are pretty involved. Okay. <laughs> they take a while. What's, what's your favorite thing about the A1? Well, I like the fact that it carries a lot of weaponry, a lot of different kinds of ordnance. And uh, when I first checked out an airplane, of course, I was a jet pilot. I flew uh, out of pilot training. I flew the F-86 initially. Then I went into ADC, Air Defense Command, uh, known as Air Defense Command at that time. And I flew the F-102 for about 250, 300 hours, something like that. And then we got the F-106, which was a real fine air-to-air uh, uh, -air interceptor aircraft. Single engine, single pilot, uh, beautiful airplane, uh, fast, about two plus. And, uh, and so I flew that airplane for about 1,300 hours. In the meantime, I was, I'd always uh, flown light planes. Uh, you know, Pipers and Cessnas and, and Beechcraft, light uh, aircraft, and uh, tailwheel type airplanes. So propeller di driven airplane was, was not unknown to me when I got into the Sky Raider because I'd flown as a private pilot uh, uh, a, a variations of light aircraft. So I was, I knew tailwheels. Uh, had gotten my seaplane rating, as a matter of fact, and I just like to fly. For, I like to fly airplanes. Uh, so uh, when I got in the A1, which I volunteered for, by the way, the story of how that happened is another one. It's uh, it's it's rather rather interesting. I was at. Uh, I spent, I guess, six about almost six years at Duluth International Airport in Minnesota flying the F-102 and the F-106. And, uh, and it was beautiful. The first time I'd ever been north of the Mason-Dixon line, I'd never seen ice or snow to any extent. But I loved it. I loved it up there. I loved the flying. And I loved the, the uh, just, I liked the winter up there, believe it or not. You know, 30 below, it was fine. It didn't bother me a bit. I had some civilian friends and the local economy there that, that I uh, made friends with and, and I really enjoyed it. And flying a great airplane. Uh, so, you know, Mach 2.3 in my life, I thought that was just a, a fantastic experience to go that fast. And uh, I had an experience uh, uh, in, let's see, September the 11th, 1961. September the 11th, 1961, I was the first uh, pilot to eject from the F-106 using a newly designed and newly installed supersonic ejection seat, and, and, it, and it saved my life. I had, a, I had a malfunction, the engine blew up. Uh, I had to get out, and I bailed out. I, I ejected using this this fine new seat that they installed, and I felt pretty good about the fact that it saved my life. And so I wrote an article that was published and, and spread around throughout Air Defense Command, and I extolled the virtues of that seat and what a wonderful thing it was because I was there to talk about it. In fact, the second guy had a, a similar malfunction to, in his aircraft. He was based at a place called Kinchelo Air Force Base up in the north. And uh, I'm trying to recall his name. Anyway, he ejected. So the first guy, I was the first, and the second guy was successful. And so we both said, man, what a, what a fine invention this is. And it was a... It was really kind of a newfangled ejection seat. Uh, it had features that were, that were designed to allow you to eject supersonic. 
Well, that was kind of a weird thing to do because he ejects supersonic anyway. I was gliding with an engine out at 250 knots when I ejected. Any, any ejection seat ever designed would, would be satisfactory. Anyway, to make a long story short, I, I caused a lot of people to be very confident about that ejection seat and ready to use it if necessary. Of course, in a, in a, in a fighter type airplane, uh, malfunctions do occur and sometimes you gotta get out and the, the ejection seat is a wonderful thing. It saved lots of lives. But this particular seat turned out to be a real dud. And, and it killed, believe me, believe me, it killed as many pilots as it saved and maybe more over a period of, uh, over a period of three or four years. The next several pilots who attempted to use that ejection seat uh, didn't make it. The seat failed. It failed in many different ways that I could explain, which wouldn't be necessarily interesting, but they, it just didn't work right. It did not work properly. And it caused fatalities, uh, very ugly fatalities. And of course, at the end of the whole thing, I felt pretty bad that I had been one to instill confidence in that seat that pilots were not this thing to use. And uh, I believe that all comes down to experience, though. I mean, you had a good experience, and had it done what it's supposed to, is that it functioned more often than 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 it it worked improperly more more times than it worked properly. Yeah. And the Air Force take uh, uh, eventually took that. Rube Goldberg ejection seat out of the airplane, and 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 it it, it ceased to exist, and they installed a more reliable, simple, uh, easily uh, well, it just didn't fail. Did the Sky Raider have an ejection seat in it? No. Or is that old-fashioned roll back canopy and get out? Well, the the. the the first, my first experiences in that airplane, it was just an over the side bailout if, if you had to go. There was no ejection seat. And, uh, and during the lifetime of the airplane, they installed a, uh, an extraction system. It was not an ejection seat. Uh, the system, the seat did not leave the airplane. Uh, in the ejection seat, you pull the handles and the seat, you and the seat go out. You separate from the seat, the parachute deploys automatically. And, and uh, what they installed in the airplane, which is really a neat, neat system that worked, it, it, it saved a lot of lives, was called an extraction system. And basically, to what it was, simply uh, defined, is a rocket with, with lanyards uh, installed so that when the rocket fired out the, well, uh, uh, you ejected the canopy first. The canopy would be ejected. And then the rocket would fire it and pull you out of the airplane. Okay. It pulled you and your chute, automatically deployed the chute. So it was an extraction system uh, rather than an ejection system. And it worked and it was, uh, it, it saved a lot of lives. I never had to use it, thank goodness. Did you ever have to? Uh, bailout in Vietnam when you were flying at all? No, no, no. Thank goodness. Yeah. Thank so goodness. you weren't like some of these guys waiting on the Jolly Green to come get you? Uh, no, I didn't have to do that. I did not have to do that. I did... Uh, uh, people ask me, were you ever shot down? And I sort of was, in a way, uh, on, a, on a flight down in the... Uh, down in the Delta region of South Vietnam, uh, I took I took a few hits in in the airplane, and, and the engine began to run real bad uh, because I took a round through a main fuel feed line, and uh, I had to land at a little abandoned airport, which was right near the target that we were working, and so I was real lucky 
to be able to get the airplane on the ground safely uh, because, uh, and I had a friend, uh, one of my buddies who, uh, one of my squadron mates landed there in and, and, and the this two place airplane. I climbed in his right seat, took off, and, and uh, went back to uh, Benoit. So, in a way, I guess you could say I got shot down, but I did make a controlled landing at an airport. Uh, with an engine that wasn't running very good. And uh, they came in in a few days, repaired the uh, fuel line, and, uh, and flew the airplane out. So that was, I told, I told the story, I think, about this, a, a buddy of mine in the squadron named Vasiliadis yeah. yesterday. And uh, he's the guy that landed there at Sock Train. Uh, and, and, I'm in his right seat, and away we went back home. Sounds like you guys were pretty tight buddies. Well, he was. A, he had been a. a he had been a, a thud pilot, an F-105 pilot, and had volunteered to fly the the uh, the A-1 for some reason. I have no idea why he did that. But, but he was just a good uh, uh, fighter pilot. He was, I just, uh, I, I tried to pick his brain and learn as much as I could about uh, ordnance delivery, and some of his experiences and techniques. And uh, and he was uh, had a little seniority on me. He'd been in uh, the Air Force for two or three years longer than I had. And uh, he was highly experienced in gunnery and dive bombing. And I just, I, I really like this guy because uh, he was a great personality and, and had great skill at, at flying the, uh, the Sky Raider. Didn't they say he went on to be a Brigadier General last night of an air wing or something like no, that? No, no, he, 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 he made Colonel and he went to the Pentagon. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick story about, uh, about Vass, his nickname Vass, Vasiliadis. I don't know, maybe I shouldn't talk about other people. But anyway, Vass, uh, when he finished his Sky Raider tour, flying with the uh, 602nd, he went back into F-105s and was flying uh, the, the F-105 missions in North Vietnam, which I'm sure you probably recognize the fact that was a very hazardous mission and uh, suffered great deal of casualty. Well, Vass got shot at and had to eject from his F-105 over North Vietnam and was severely injured when he landed in a real, real rough uh, part of uh, a rocky area that uh, he couldn't make a decent parachute landing. And uh, it injured him real bad. And uh, they predicted that you know, maybe your flying career is over. Uh, he uh, spent a lot of long time in the hospital recuperating from his injuries. And would you believe, and at that time, the THUD pilots, the THUD, the F-105, uh, the deal was 100 missions north and you go home. It was, that was the deal. Well, he had flown less than 100. I don't know how many, maybe 80, 85, maybe. I don't know for sure. But uh, he had vowed to himself to get well, to get back in the cockpit. And I think I got this story right. He uh, got well, worked himself back on flying status, got back in the F-105, and went back and finished his 100 minutes missions. So, He's he he's a great guy. Very determined. Very determined. He's uh, he's still alive, as far as I know, living up in the uh, Maryland area near Washington. Uh, he's not in great health now, unfortunately. But uh, a, a real a real aviator. Anyway, I got off on this subject. I That's fine. You know, he's a guy that, that I ran into in my story yesterday. He he was in the left seat instructing the guy in the right seat on his first combat mission. 
first in combat mission. And I'm the wingman. And we ran together. Uh, I swear the air aircraft malfunctioned. <laughs> I, 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 I think it did. Anyway, we ran together on the runway making a formation landing and it destroyed both airplanes. <laughs> and we weren't hurt, we weren't injured, but Vasilio, Butch Vasilio, who ended up being a, a highly ranked four-star general in the U.S. Air Force, uh, was his right seat <laughs> guy getting checked out at that time. He was a lieutenant, Lieutenant Butch Vasilio. And uh, well, that was his initiation into, into combat out of, it, out of uh, Benoit. What year was that when that happened? 1965, about, ah. uh, oh, I guess, August to September 1965. How wide is a runway if you're going to do a formation takeoff? Well, it was just day-to-day -day normal operation. I mean, we did it every day, every day, every day. It's, uh, I guess the runway there was 150 feet wide. I don't remember for sure, but it was plenty adequate for safe formation operations, and we did that. We did it on a daily basis. Wow. Wow. But anyway, I told that story yesterday, and, and uh, that's a little humor because nobody was hurt. Two airplanes were hurt. But uh, <laughs> so there's a, there's a degree of humor there. To listen to Butch talk about it, you know, uh, he puts a little humor into it. So. May I ask you a question? Sure. If... If a young person asked you about serving, what would you tell them? Is you it, mean my 28 years in the Air Force? If they were looking to say, should I go in the military, what do you? What oh, would you tell I'm, them? I, I'd strongly encourage it. I would strongly encourage it. Uh, things have changed an awful lot over the years. You know, I retired in 1984, so I've been a civilian longer than I was in the Air Force, even though I was in the Air Force for 28 years. But uh, it's a good life. Uh, if you want to serve your country, if you want to be a, uh, if you want to have a feeling of having done something worthwhile, uh, having contributed something in some small way, uh, I, I would recommend. I mean, you know, and the benefits aren't that bad, really. Uh, the security is is uh, comforting. The uh, I always felt. Uh, as, uh, as I progressed through my career, and my friends sometimes would, would get out and go to work for the airlines or, or whatever, uh, I had a feeling of, of uh, I don't think it was patriotism as much as it was just uh, uh, a feeling of, of calmness and uh, that you're doing the right thing. You can't be criticized so much for being a soldier. You know, so mm -hmm. uh, the medical benefits at that time were good. They're still pretty good, as a matter of fact. Uh, so yes, I encourage uh, I encourage uh, participation in, as a military person in all branches. Really, I kind of favor the Air Force. Uh, I favor flying if you're good enough to uh, physically to make that grade and and. Uh, so I think uh, I'm I'm really lucky. I just I'm, my my wife says <laughs> I'm just lucky to be here, <laughs> and I feel like I am. Really. Your wife is a very sweet woman. Uh, we met a little bit last night. Well, thank you. Where thank did you, you meet her? Oh, <laughs> it, uh, I met her at, at 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 her front door. I knocked on her front door. <laughs> it's a long story. But I was buying, I was buy, I was investing in real estate, buying rental houses, and uh, I had purchased a house next door to her, and I just wanted to meet the neighbor, because I like to meet the neighbors and see, you know, if I buy a house, I'm going to rent it, I want to know who I'm, who uh, the neighbors are, and uh, so I knocked on her door. She was a uh, had been recently, fairly recently widowed, and uh, so we. Talked on the phone a few times, and, and she says, I ask her, you don't smoke, do you? Because <laughs> I had just quit, <laughs> and I did not want to get tangled up with anybody that, 
that uh, there was a smoker, so she said, no. I said, well, good. I said, you don't drink much, do you? <laughs> now, I'm not opposed to having a shot now and then, but uh, she says, no, maybe a glass of wine now and then. So things really looked good on the phone, and we got together. And our first date, I took her flying. <laughs> Atta boy. What'd you take her up in? In a Cessna 152, two-place tra little trainer. Yep. And uh, she felt pretty good about it. And then she began to really like flying. And I'd take her up uh, uh, and we'd fly aerobatics. I had access, I had access to a really good little uh, two-place uh, airplane that was fully aerobatic, a decathlon. And I'd strap her in the back seat. We had to wear a parachute. Had to wear a parachute mm -hmm. if you plan to do aerobatics. And uh, I'd strap in the back seat of that decathlon, and we'd go fine. And she'd just scream and holler and have the best time. We'd we'd put on a little impromptu air show for big friends of hers, you know, and and we had a good time. In good. fact, my very first, my last legal flight in a. In a in, as a pilot, I lost my medical because of medical problems that that, uh, that I had. So I, the FAA won't let me fly anymore. But uh, my last flight, my last legal flight, was in the Stearman, which is an old biplane, old two-place biplane trainer. And uh, I took her up. We did loops and rolls. And that was the last time I had to fly. I was able to fly as a as a rated uh, civilian pilot. We kind of got off the subject, didn't we? Well, we've meandered around it a little bit, but it's finding out about who you are, Wynn. Yeah. Um, oh, we're getting ready. I guess they're getting ready to fly the Sky Raider now, so you want to go out and watch them take off? Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, I I'm sorry. So. I don't know what's next on the agenda. I think they were, the yeah, were going to finish lunch and do that. Um, one last thing. Uh, let's, let's tie it up with a little bit more Sky Raider just real quick. Um, yeah, let's see. You were talking about your love of flying a tail dragger and uh, how it was very exciting to uh, fly the Sky Raider. To uh, me, it was easy to fly, you know, really, even though it had that gigantic engine and lots of torque. And uh, uh, but it was, I, I found it to be an easy airplane to transition into and fun. It, it was just, you know, this. You, you hear that thing run, it makes your heart beat fast. <laughs> makes your whole body shake when that thing oh, starts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I used to think it was such a, such an exciting thing to crank that dude up. And I ended up, uh, as, as I told you yesterday, or somebody mentioned the fact that I ended up flying 657 combat missions in two years in, in that airplane. And I uh, had over, I had over 2,000 hours of total time in the airplane because of the two tours in, in Vietnam and, uh, and then my instructor experience at, at Herbert Field. I had a lot of, and then I got back into jets uh, after I got out of the A-1 and ended up uh, my flying career in the uh, F-4 family. And uh, so that's kind of, like you said, it wraps it up. I got off subject, and I'm sorry. No. I was talking about things that had nothing to do with, with what we're doing right now, the Sky Raider and, and uh, my ejection from the F-106. It's all part of your, your lineage and everything yes, that you've done. Well, someday, if, someday if, you want to hear, if you want to hear a really, really interesting story that'll, that'll get your attention, I'll tell you about it. The night I got lost in a little single-engine airplane in the weather and uh, ran out of gas. <laughs> what is it they say? <laughs> ran out of altitude, good idea, or altitude, airspeed, and good ideas all yeah. at the same time. Yeah. So it looks like you made it out okay with it. You know who said that? <laughs> the first time I told that story to her was at a restaurant on a date and she thought <laughs> what have I got myself tangled up with <laughs> well Wynn I want to thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us I it's really appreciate fun. it it's been fun kind of going back reliving some of that yes it really has. 
I've, I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Have you enjoyed uh, and being around the guys oh, this let weekend? Me tell you, let me tell you, this uh, Roger Youngblood, the guy I've never met before, but I'd heard about him, and I thought, man, what a neat guy. I just, I just really enjoyed meeting him. And uh, to, to have my reunion with Ken Holston, you know, Ken is a, he's flying the Sky Raider right yep. now. That sounds like they're cranking up right now. He's the Sky Raider pilot. I thought he was flying. He oh, yeah. Well, yeah. let's, go let's go see this. No, thank you, sir. I really came here to listen more than to speak. Uh, I was hoping to hear from you guys. But let, let me, I, I will, as Don was talking, I, a, f a few things occurred to me. First of all, I did not realize how significant the mission that the SOG guys were accomplishing until I read a couple of books a few years ago that explained it. I, I had no idea. Uh, I participated in in several insertions, uh, lots of extractions, most of them successful, not all of them. And at the time, I had no idea what that was all about. I just knew that we were being called on to help and, and we, we <laughs> did the best we could to help. Um, the more I listened to you guys, the more I recognized what, uh, what heroic actions took place on the ground while we were up there, cozy in our airplane, generally safe, and uh, we had a lot of advantages. Number one, our airplane carried a lots of ordnance, lots of different kinds of ordnance. Uh, it's amazing the things that we, that we were able to, uh, to load on that airplane. And we had communication. One of our advantages, we could talk to you guys. The fast movers couldn't. They had UHF radio, they couldn't talk to you. They had to talk through a fact or, but we could talk to you guys and, and that was really a, a, an advantage for us to work in, in supporting you on the ground. Um, the Sky Raider at that time supporting that mission was the ideal airplane. They could not have they could not have invented a better machine for the purposes that we put that machine to support uh, uh, you guys. Um, and like I say, I, I, I just didn't realize how, how, how significant your mission was and, and, and the part that we played in it. Um, I, I've, as Don was talking, I thought of several war stories that uh, that I know you would enjoy if there were time for me to relate them. There's not time, so maybe at dinner or something, if you want to hear some, some uh, really funny things. Uh, oh, give us one. Well, I, I'll give you one. It's not funny. Well, yeah, it, it may. You might find a little humor in this. There was a team on the ground, and they were in trouble, and they needed help, and I had. I was the lead of a flight of two, and I had wall-to-wall -wall napalm. Now, one of the rules that we always uh, uh, adhered to was you never fly over the friendlies and expending ordnance, particularly low-altitude stuff like CBU and napalm. You just don't fly over the good guys, and uh, you fly parallel or, or whatever. Anyway. These guys on the ground, I was talking to them on their Fox mic or whatever, and, and uh, they were in, a, in, in deep trouble. The, guy, the bad guys were real close, and the, the commander on the ground, the troop commander said, uh, he told me which direction he wanted, us to, wanted me to come in and drop my, my napalm. The, the, the bad guys, I guess, were really, really close. And the only way that I could that he saw that I could expend that napalm and, and help him was to come in over the, over the good guys, over him. And I, I argued about it. I said, no, you, don't, you, don't, you know, we really don't want to do that. And he said, yeah, you do. We want you to do that. Well, <clears throat> so I did. I rolled in, 
flew right over the friendlies, pickled off the napalm, and as I pulled off, I heard on my radio, I swear to God, this was the exact words. He said, you got us. Now, what do you think I felt at that time? My heart stopped. I, I froze. And I come back and said, uh, you know, tell me about it. He said, well, you didn't really get us, but damn, that was close. <laughs> How do you think I felt then? <laughs> I felt great. And he explained a little later that the, uh, that the heat from the napalm was so intense that they did, in fact, feel that heat. And, but he used the wrong words when he called and said, you got us. Jeez, come on, man. That was a very successful uh, mission, and they were uh, successfully extracted a little bit later in the day. Um, I have some, some audio tapes. I took a tape recorder with me on a lot of missions, and I have some, some tapes at home that I go back and listen to occasionally of, uh, of our supporting the guys on the ground. And uh, it sure brings back... Uh, brings back memories. Um, some of the war stories I'll tell you are, like I said, I won't do it today. We're, we don't have time. You really don't want to hear. Uh, Ken Holston has heard just about every one. Uh, <laughs> he's sitting there listening. He's, he's saying, you know, you got to tell the same story. Don't, don't screw it up. Don't screw it up. Oh, well, it's not short. Uh, my 657th mission came back to land at Pleiku and uh, pitched out, put the gear down, put the gear, uh, to put the gear handle down, and the gear handle wouldn't move. The gear handle was binding, and it just, it just wouldn't move. So... I climbed back over the airport, put the plane on autopilot, uh, called the ground, told them I had a problem, couldn't get the gear down. And uh, uh, one of my fellow classmates, or, or squadron mates rather, Jack Gaffney, climbed up in an airplane on the ramp, communicating through people on the ground back to me uh, about what I could do to solve this problem. Now, I was on autopilot, had the airplane in a, in a gentle bank circling overhead. I had a wingman that was watching every, the whole thing. And, uh, and he suggested that I unscrew a panel that's kind of down to the left-hand side of the... Of the uh, yeah, I go back out there and look at that and find <laughs> out exactly where it is. But anyway, I was supposed to take this panel off, and behind the panel is some linkage that I could free up this handle and get my gear down. Well, I ended up unstrapping, turning myself upside down in the cockpit with my head down near the rudder pedals with a pocket, with a, a hunting knife that I carried in, in, on my survival kit. And using the tip of the hunting knife, I was able to unscrew several of the screws that held this panel in place and was able to peel back enough of it to get to that linkage. And I don't know exactly what I did or how I did it, but I was able to, to shake it and vibrate it and move it. And pulling on the gear handle, the gear handle in this airplane is a big old thing, and, and I was finally able to get the gear down one at a time over a span of about probably 30, 40 minutes, 30 or 40 minutes, a long time. And then I got back up and, and sat down and strapped back in, and, and, and the gear handle still would not stay down exactly. I mean, when I turn it loose, it'd go back up. It was binding on something then. And so I was finally able to put the gear handle down and push it beyond. There was a plunger type thing that uh, I forgot what that plunger was for, but had to do with the emergency gear lowering or something. Forward and neutral, and puts, isolates the hydraulics to the emergency extension. 
Yeah, so I pushed it beyond that plunger, and that kind of locked it so it couldn't come back up. So the gear handle is down, the gear's down, and I'm able to land and taxi in, and that was my last flight <laughs> in, the, in the sky. And at home, at home, one of the one of the ground crew there at Play Coup drew a cartoon picture, a big thing about this big, a big picture. I have it at home. I wish I'd brought it. That depicted the airplane and the pilot with his feet sticking out of the cockpit, <laughs> and uh, boats and nuts flying out of the cockpit. And uh, and I really I, I cherish that uh, that that picture. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> this, I, I wish I had time to tell some. Quick question, sir. Yes. How many times did you return to base with tree trunks or tree branches in your aircraft, sir? <laughs> <laughs> Twice in one day. <laughs> Twice in one day. And. Uh, and they needed pilots real bad, so they never they never grounded me. <laughs> I, 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 I flew the next day, as a matter of fact. One of those one of those the first one in the morning, I was flying out of Quinyon, and an army an army guy who was a Mohawk pilot. Uh, uh, what's a Mohawk? It's some kind of a reconnaissance thing that they anyway. Anyway, he said, yeah, he said, if I can fly with you in the right seat, we're flying the E-model, two-place airplane, then I'll give you a ride in the Mohawk. Well, good deal. I'm getting me a combat mission in the Mohawk. <laughs> so, so he climbs in my right seat, and we go out, and again, I'm dropping napalm. I got too low, went through some smoke, hit the damn tree, <laughs> and came back with, with dents and dents in the airplane and scared the hell out of him. Uh, so I played it cool, you know. I said, well, you know, we, we, do, we do that sort of thing. <laughs> and didn't hurt anything. I mean, they put some, some combat tape on the wingtips, you know. And the, it, the, the airplane wasn't damaged real bad. It really wasn't. It was able to fly again. Later that afternoon, I was flying another mission. And uh, my, my flight commander, Kit Carson was his name. Anybody ever run into him? Kit Carson, yeah. He, uh, he, was, he, was, he missed the target. He just couldn't seem to hit the target. He had, we had wall-to-wall -wall white phosphorus bombs he had. Can you imagine that load? What a weird thing to load on an airplane. But he was missing the target. He wasn't getting in there. I was getting kind of uptight because, because I had napalm and I can hit that damn target. I'm I'm not, I'm not going to miss. And uh, white phosphorus bombs really put out a lot of smoke. I mean, a lot of smoke. Well, I rolled in to pickle off my nape and I flew through the clouds of the of the the white phosphorus, the Willie Pete bombs not realizing that the clouds were obscuring some really tall trees. And I went, I hit the damn trees. And I mean, I really hit them. It's, it did a number on that airplane. It, I hit it so hard, it jerked the stick right out of my hand. And so I, I should have bought the farm, I really should have. But I was very lucky again. <laughs> and I was able to climb out and did a, a, a stall check to find out what the stall speed would be on the airplane. And, and I landed at Play Coup. I was, I was flying that mission out of Quinyon, but I landed at Play Coup. And I taxied in, and uh, uh, I, I landed that airplane probably 20, 30 knots above normal approach speed because the stall speed with all the damage was really high. And the guys stood there and watched me as I parked. Well, a lot of guys came out with cameras, taking pictures. <laughs> and I remember one guy in particular, and I think if I give you his name, you'll remember, a guy by the name of Bernie Fisher, Medal of Honor winner, 
Bernie Fisher stood there and took my took pictures of my airplane. I talked to him later about getting pictures of that. But that airplane never flew again. <laughs> they hauled it off to the boneyard and used it for parts. <laughs> it did a number on it broke the main spar. Uh, it it really did did a tore the airplane up. I was so lucky to uh, to have survived that dumb thing that I did. But uh, I, someday I'll tell you a story about how I ended up on my second tour. <clears throat> I was having marital troubles. My wife was, <laughs> she was away a lot and, and we were on the verge of a divorce. And, and I was at the stag bar at Hurlbut and we had a genuine stag bar. I mean, it was, there were no women allowed that kind of thing today just would not exist. But at that time, it was accepted. And I was at the stag bar with Ford. And we were both shit-faced. <laughs> and Wallace Ford looked at me and he says, how'd you like to go back to Nam?" I said, doing what? He said, flying the A1H, the H model, the single place, hot dog. I'd never flown that airplane. I'd been flying this two-place fat face E model, and uh, and he said, "How'd you like to go back?" I said, "I'd I'd love it." <laughs> so I signed up to go back with uh, with him as my commander, and as Don mentioned a minute ago, after we landed at Pleiku and timed off that C-141 and was greeted with the fact that you're no longer the commander of this organization, it was a very sad thing, very sad for me, and he was. He was, he was very sad because, you know, he put the squadron together and he had a bunch of volunteers for the most part, not all of them, but a lot of the guys were, were, were volunteers. And uh, anyway, so I, I talk to you guys over dinner or something and tell you some, or if you want to hear some of the lies I've told, talk to Ken Holston, he's heard all of them. I enjoy being here. Uh, like I say, I didn't really come to talk. I came to listen, and mostly I want to listen to you guys. And it was a real joy last night hearing some of the things there at dinner, and, and I hope to hear some more stories uh, uh, tonight and tomorrow, tomorrow night. Thank you very much. I'm done. How much time do we have? Uh, uh, Um, five or ten minutes you got? I want to do a couple other things real quick, too. Right? Can I have five minutes? Oh, yeah. Should be able to have the whole afternoon. No, I wish. I wish. But I was thinking of I was thinking of war stories, and some of them are not of interest to the average person. But I thought this was kind of interesting. Oh, okay. Well, I'll only take three minutes. Okay. I'll give, I'll give you two minutes. I was flying uh, out of uh, Benoit in the E model, the, the A1E, and one of my early missions, I guess maybe number 50 or so, and uh, I was a wingman on a two ship. My leader was a guy by the name of uh, Vasiliadis, we called him Vas, hell of a fighter pilot. I don't know if you ever heard of that name, but he was just, he was, he was my idol. He taught me things. And, uh, and he had a new guy in his right seat on his first combat mission. We always put a new guy in the right seat for the first mission or two just to get, them, get their feet wet. And so the new guy's in his right seat, and we went out and we dropped some ordnance and came back to land at, uh, at Benoit. And I'm on his wing and made a formation landing. And I swear I lost control of the airplane for, for a reason I didn't understand at that time. They claimed later on that the brake locked up. I was never charged with any, any problem. The accident board uh, uh, told me it was, uh, or, or their, their report freed me of any responsibility. But anyway, I landed on his wing and, and I veered into his aircraft as we rolled out on the runway at about 100 knots. And I raised the wing of my airplane to try to 
to fly it away from him so that I didn't run into him. So I'm rolling out on the wing with, with my full aileron, lifted the wing, and as, as I ran out of speed, uh, airspeed, the wing came down on his airplane. And we exited the, uh, the runway in a big cloud of dust. And uh, I, it, neither one of those airplanes ever flew again. We, I wiped out both, both airplanes. Get, and get two more in your ace. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I got, I got to, I got, I got to tell you enough. Anyway, anyway, the guy that getting his first ride in the right seat with Vasiliotis with Fast, he went on to become a four-star general in, in the Air Force. His name was Butch Vasilio. I don't know if you've ever heard of Butch Vasilio, but uh, that's the guy that was in the right seat. He said, "Hell of a thing to look on your landing and look at the belly of your wingman," you know. But uh, quick, one more story. Vass, Vass and I were, were, were drinking and partying a little bit at Quinyan, uh, one of the places where we pulled alert. And uh, it was pitch black, dark. And we got the word back that there was an outpost under attack that needed help. Is there anybody that would volunteer to go support this army post. The name of the post, by the way, I, you probably know, never heard of it, but the name of the post was Dock Sut, D-A-K-S-U-T. Anybody heard of that place? Been there? Been there? Dock Sut. So it's uh, over in, it's in a valley with a lot of tall mountains around, all around. And uh, the weather was bad and I flew Vass's wing. Vass was the lead. We volunteered to go. And um, Quinyan, we didn't have runway lights at that time. They, they, they lined up some jeeps along the side of the runway to light the, our way. Actually, it was just barely getting dark when we took off, but when we got back, it was really dark. But uh, Vass flew us down through the clouds. We broke out underneath, expended our ordnance, supposedly did a hell of a good job of, of repelling the attack and a lot of the, they closed that place down. They finally got them out of there. And, and about, uh, about a month later at Benoit, this was after my accident where I'd run into him on landing and wiped out two airplanes. Uh, a general showed up to, put, to pin some medals on and Vass and I both were given DFCs. That was for the night we flew the mission at Dock Soot through the clouds, and, and uh, it was really a, uh, both of us had, had, had been drinking a little, and <laughs> or we probably wouldn't have gone anyway. But, <laughs> but anyway, they, they, wanted, they pinned DFCs on us, and they teased the hell out of us about the reason we got DFCs was surviving this <laughs> formation landing where I'd run into it. And, uh, and that's so everybody teased us and made fun of us. And so that's just another story. In Panama. I didn't have to go to, to, uh, to uh, Clark because I'd already gone. To, uh, and I'd just gotten out of Stead. I was in one of the very last, if not the last class, that graduated from Stead before they closed it. And moved it to uh, where it's all time. Yeah. Anyway, I'm right out of stead, which was pretty grueling, and I was in pretty good physical condition. They sent me to, to uh, Panama to go to jungle school. That's where the Air Force Jungle <laughs> Survival School was located at that time. And part of the program, as it was at, in uh, the Philippines, I guess, was an E and E program where they had local natives out hunting for you. Yeah. And and I, and I was paired up with a guy who we had determined we didn't want to get captured. I mean, we just didn't. So fortunately, uh, the first night we slept in our hammocks 
And the next morning we woke up and ran into a couple of Panamanian people out in the jungle. They weren't the Negritos that were looking for us. They were hunters and they had guns, they had shotguns, and they were hunting. So we, I couldn't speak Spanish, but my buddy who I paired up with could speak Spanish. And he spoke to these guys and asked them if they would, told them the map, gave them the map, and here's where we want to go. Can you help us get there? Well, we gave them some money. We paid them. And they guaranteed us that they could get us there without being captured. So we followed these hunters, and, and they sure enough got us to the camp early, before we could check in. And we had a time when you can't go before a certain time. you got to be after this time to check in to the, to the safe camp. You know? So, and it was right on the bank of a river. <clears throat> well, we paid off the guys that got us. We had our own guys, and they guided us there, and we were there safe. So we thought, what the hell are we going to do waiting for the time that we can check in at the camp? We climbed a tree on the bank of the, of the river, and we're both, the two of us, are up in this damn tree. And who should show up at the base of the tree but the native guys that were hunting for us. <laughs> And they're down there splashing around at the bank of the river and yak yakking to themselves, you know. And we're up there in the tree looking down at them. And uh, we saw, we decided that we're going to play a trick on them. So, so what we did, we jumped down and we're making all kinds of crazy noises and splashed into the river about knee, knee hip high and going, ah, like that. And it scared them so bad they ran away. <laughs> and, and they didn't capture us. We captured them away, you know. And then in the safe camp, right on the bank of the river. So we walked in first. The first guys there, out of about 30 guys, they were out hunting, you know, wandering around in the woods. And we were the first ones in. And uh, and we had played a trick on the natives, the Negritos, or, or whatever you call them. Did the instructors ever find out about it? No, no, no. We didn't tell them. We didn't tell them. But it was it was just hilarious to scare them to the point that they ran off. So anyway, that's my story. And I'm sticking to it. But we were the first guys into the camp. And, then, and, and one of the, the, the wives of some of the native locals had made a big pot of stew out of iguana. The iguana is, is, is yeah, yeah. It was delicious. I mean, it is really good. If you ever get a chance to eat some iguana, it is a very tender, white... Yeah, we, we had one die in our house. <laughs> we should have had... We, I, did, I wish I'd known that. We would have had a good it really is. Is. Carol's, Carol's sister was staying was there for a bit. And her kids had an iguana for a pet. And it was downstairs. We had a bathroom downstairs. And one day she decided it was too warm and she was going to give it a cool bath. And that cold water just, ah! <laughs> we, where, were we, where were we? Where were we where they had these damn aquariums? Don't get that wrong. And they, we were at a restaurant, and they'd come up to the table. Oh, no, that was in, that was in Costa Rica. And they're begging like, like any other animal. Like, like that, yeah. They come right up to the table and look at them like, Can you, give me something to eat. The restaurant, we were sitting with sort of out on the porch, you know. Mm -hmm. This is where in Costa Rica. Costa Rica. Costa Rica. Costa Rica. Costa Rica. Costa Rica. Oh, it could have been. He had not made a movie about Air Force uh, Sky Raider pilots or pilots, you know. And John Wayne was 
a little grit in his teeth, you know, and this little cat. You got to remember, it's such a hard day work. Oh yeah, he just come in after making the film, you know. And uh, but I forgot the exact words, but he put that little captain down so bad, you know, like who the hell are you, or what do you need to know, or you know. Anyway, it was really good. Right. We partied that night at the at the. It, actually, it was an Eglin stag party because it was across the street, you know, yeah. on the club side. I know exactly. that was the old club building. Yeah. Right, yeah, that exactly. mafia building. The mafia yeah, used to yeah, own yeah. that damn building. Yeah. The real stag bar. So I'm yeah. the, the real, who's the head mafia guy back in the day? Al Capone. Yeah, Al Capone owned that building yeah, next that's to it. That's, 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 that's a story. That's story. And if you go dig in the sand that's out the there by the beach. I like, yeah. I like <laughs> the There's stuff buried there. I'm telling you, man. sir. We're ready to serve the food. First come, first serve. Okay. Well, Leave the herd. Shy, I'm I'm for you. There you go. Y'all better hurry. We're telling lies. You probably need to out the phone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 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 are we going to sit here talking to you? No. Nice one tonight. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're going to sit here talking to you. No. We got stories to tell. Okay. Hey. I'll be the last one in line. Don't you worry. Exactly. You got the Al audience is thinning out. I think they've got the eight wins. Yeah. Officer's on. Club. All right, we'll tell guys when we go. On that right, officer's everybody come club. Right back here. A lot of things went on between the end of the back door and the beach. But the stag bar next to the Robert <laughs> Al Capone right. Officer Club was a real stag bar. No women permitted. Period. I never saw a woman in our. I season. never saw a woman in that stag bar. But you know, <laughs> I'll tell you what. Job again was to do what? Over. <laughs> He's the base commander now. Well, if the strippers went too far, yeah, I'd too get far. fired. <laughs> so what's I too, far? too far? The definition. So I have to make sure. No. What is the what is the definition of too far? <laughs> okay. What? I was there four years as a test pilot. I can't. Get no, no, no. We didn't have any rules other than you couldn't touch the strippers. Fighter pilots could not touch the strip. Sounds like the same rules are in place today. <laughs> I don't know if they still do that, but I don't think they have a stag bar there either. Oh, no. But the base, the, uh, the sector, com or the uh, Tiffley commander, who was General Kelly, General Kelly called me in one day and he said, it's your job to make sure that things don't get out of hand. My goodness.